Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to More Talks. This is a new series from Thomas More University where we present short, powerful talks devoted to spreading ideas, thoughts, and information to our communities. Uh, my name is Michael Orr. I work at Thomas More University. This is our first episode in the More Talks series, and I am incredibly grateful to have people joining us here today. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we get started. First, this More Talks is being recorded, and a final recording will be made available on Thomas More University's website. We'll be sending a link to it uh, after the presentation, so you'll get that either today or tomorrow. Uh, if you find this talk engaging, if you find it thought-provoking, please feel free to share it with others. We want to keep spreading this uh, around as we get started with the series. Second, I want to make a quick note on the structure of the talk. Our speaker is going to make a presentation, and then after that, it will be followed by a Q&A session. As we've all become all too familiar with Zoom, there is a wonderful chat feature involved, which allows you to participate in the conversation. I want to encourage you to use that chat to submit questions that you might have, and uh, we'll see if we can use those during the Q&A session and let your voice be heard as well. Uh, to make it as relevant as possible to our audience. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce our first guest speaker on More Talks. Thank you, Robin Norton. Uh, Robin joined the Thomas More University team in 2017, and since then has served as our assistant director for the Republic Bank Foundation's Institute for Career Development and Graduate School Planning. Robin, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here today. And Michael, I'd like to take a moment. We are uh, called the Republic Bank Foundation Institute of Career Development and Graduate School Planning. So I would just like to make a, a note of thanks to the foundation. You help us to do what we do for our students and alumni, and I am deeply grateful. Thank you very much. And the, the mission of this, in, this particular institute is a subset of that of Thomas More University. Our goal is to help students find their place in the world, whether that's on a path to career, graduate school, or something else of their choosing. And just a shout out to an alum, our alumni, you're included in that mission as well. The door doesn't close when you leave, it's still open. Also a, a thank you to Bailey Bundy, our Director of Alumni and Parent Engagement. Thank you for this opportunity, I appreciate it. And thank you to Michael and Taylor uh, for being here and. Helping, helping me to make this happen today. I, I appreciate all your support. So the topic I wanna to talk about today is not um, something that would surprise you. It's something, it's a topic of conversation in our offices, virtually of course, and you know, out in the world. I'm going to talk about preparing for a job search during a pandemic. What I'm not going to do, I'm not gonna give you 101 things to do to prepare for a job search, tell you how to write a resume, or give you 27 job websites to visit. You can do that on your own. Any of the information in this talk that you want to know about more deeply, you can go to the Thomas More website. You can simply Google it. It's all available to you at your fingertips. What I'd like to do is offer a direction that might help you or someone that you care about, a direction and perhaps a mindset that will help us be better prepared for a future, give us a greater degree of control and lower our anxiety as we step forth into this, this unknown territory. You know, looking for a job on a good day is, is an anxiety producing endeavor. Let's throw in a pandemic where employers are having to suspend hiring and sometimes forced to rescind job offers. This is a, a strange and very difficult world to navigate. You may have friends and family caught in this situation or maybe in it yourself. And instead of talking at you for the next few minutes, I'd just like to share some stories that have been shared with me recently in our office about people's struggles with unemployment during this, this unusual time of, of uh, during our economy. These are not stories from specific individuals, but they're really amalgamations of many stories together that I've heard in the last few months. I will also share some tools and really one perspective that can support us during this time. And together, I'd like to take these tools and this perspective and imagine how the protagonists and the story, uh, stories I'm going to share might imagine different future for themselves. So let's start. Ian is a 36-year-old uh, regional manager for sales and events for a high-end hotel chain in the greater Cincinnati area. In mid-April, he got a phone call letting him know that he and his team were going to be furloughed for 30 days. 30 days passed and he was informed that he and most of his team had lost their positions due to, we know what the hospitality industry looks like, they've been hit very hard. 
He and his wife, who works part-time as an accountant, have two school-aged children. Ian's income is their primary income. He also provides their health care benefits. They have a little bit of a cushion, but they don't know what's going to happen past the three-month mark. To say that they are overwhelmed is an understatement. Story number two. Jasmine is a newly minted Thomas More University graduate. She excelled on the women's soccer team and maintained a 3.5 GPA in her business administration major. She's one of those students who did everything she could to excel. She took part-time jobs, had an excellent internship last summer, and amazing, amazingly was offered a job at the end of it. So she's coasted through the whole year knowing she would have employment at, at the end of her senior year. She too received a phone call in April, not the same. She was told that although her job offer would be honored, um, the start date would be pushed out till July. Unfortunately, due to changes in the economy, that offer also was rescinded. Her employer suggested she stay in touch and apologize for the situation. Jasmine has no safety net. She's a student. She doesn't know how she's going to live while she looks for a job. She is definitely anxious and definitely worried about the future. These are tough stories and they're not at all uncommon. I would like to remind the Ians and the Jasmines of three tools that we all need to pick up during any economy when we're working, when we're working to look for a job. And three tools, really two tools and a perspective that we need during this economy, during a time of unemployment that can help us get to a new place. So three things that are the same and three things that are different. Michael, could you go to the next slide for me? There you are. So during any economy, we know we need specific documentation to prepare. We need to prepare for interviews and research employers we want to connect with. During this economy, we may need to adjust our, I, I have timeline, I need time frame. We need to maybe adjust our expectations of time frame. Networking and backup plans are two other topics I'd like to talk about with you. So these three items that are the same, now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you can Google this, as I said before, you can go to our website and learn about all of these things, how to do them very well. First of all, documents. Resumes, cover letters, and work samples. These need to be flawless. Resumes need to be targeted to employers in specific roles. It is not acceptable to blanket the universe with a single resume. Interview preparation. Do this. We can all Google common interview questions and should prepare them and consider what questions we might ask of our own. Now in this time um, of COVID, many of us are interviewing virtually and that will probably continue. So again, we can all Google what are tips for virtual interviews. One of the things I'm doing right now, I'm not looking up at the pictures, but I'm looking at the camera. It gives the, the people you're talking to the sense that you're looking into their eyes. There are many other things to share and I encourage you to do a little research. Thirdly, research employers. Before we ever connect with an employer, recruiter, whoever it is that we're speaking to, we should visit their website. What do they do? Can we speak about it articulately? Why do they do it? What is their mission? Look for press releases that tell us what is new and upcoming in their organization. And for goodness sake, stalk the interviewer that you're going to, or whoever's interviewing you on LinkedIn. They expect this and they like to know that you're doing your research. Find out what you have in common with that person and perhaps what their own trajectory might be. Bottom line, be able to have an intelligent conversation with this individual. All right, three things that are different during the economy. I'm going to use the word time frame. As this pandemic continues, it is likely that many employers will have to continue suspension of hiring practices. They will hire again. We just don't know when. I cannot tell you if there will be another wave of this pandemic. People are telling us it's very likely. We need to prepare for that. We will get over this at some point and we need to be prepared. The bottom line is the average job search we used to say would take three to six months. It may be now upwards of a year. Let that sink in. Cut yourself some slack and adjust your expectations. This is not gonna happen overnight. Number two, networking. And I know what you're saying. Robin, you need to do networking during any economy. And that's true. I just really wanted you to pay attention because now we need to network with intensity. What is networking? It's really just connecting with other individuals to exchange information or to make social and professional contacts. That's it. And before we dive into networking, two things. 
Oh, it's one thing. Update your brand. How do we do that? Clean up your social media. Take a moment and look at all your accounts. Make sure there's nothing there that would turn off an employer or lose the job that you have now. Take down posts or make them private, whatever it is you need to do. Secondly, LinkedIn. It's still the gold standard for professional media, social media platforms. Students and alumni, you also have access to Handshake. You can do the same thing there. Update your content, add pictures and videos, definitely keywords for the roles that you're interested in having right now. For LinkedIn, you may consider reaching out to people you've worked with, volunteered with, served on in different groups with, and ask for recommendations for things you know you do well. And give those recommendations, because remember, networking both, goes both ways. It's not just for you, it's for others as well. When I talk about networking with my students, I get this deer in the headlights look because they often think about very formal types of events. You know, big rooms where everyone's in professional attire, nervous, hoping they can manage to stay there for 30 minutes. That's a whole nother talk and, and you can you know, find more information on the internet about that as well and I'd be pleased to do that another time. But I'd like to focus on virtual networking events and informal networking. There are virtual networking events right now that you can attend. You can Google it and you will find that many associations, some colleges and employers also have virtual networking events. I have watched over the summer as different organizations have planned live events. They're converting them to virtual ones right now. That's fantastic. So you can simply Google those and attend them and, and have those experiences. Um, for students and alumni, I would like to remind you, and really for anyone attending any institution, everyone has an online job platform. In Handshake, we are seeing employers come into this space advertising virtual conferences and virtual networking events that you can attend this summer, so I encourage you to go there. Informal networking, however, is really where it's at for all of us this summer. Um, we're online like this, talking to our friends and family, um, but I hear people say things like, well, I don't, I don't know that many people. I don't know who to reach out to. And I'm here to say, yes, you do. You have friends, family, roommates, neighbors, Zuma instructors, next door neighbors, friends from church, um, a coach, faculty members. You met somebody at a picnic. This is your network. Reach out to them and tell them what you're looking for and how to connect with you. You can also reach out to offices like the ICG. Campus career offices across the country have gone virtual. They're still there. We're all still in business. We're still seeing students and alumni. So reach out to these offices as well. One plug for, in my opinion, the gold standard of networking, the informational interview. I do have a great flyer on our website that will explain it in more detail. But an informational interview, as you can see in this picture, is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's a conversation with someone who is in a role that you aspire to, or is more in a more advanced, you know, is in a more advanced place down the career path than, than you are at this time. You ask for a 20 to 30 minute conversation to find out more about the industry, um, the employer, or the role that you're looking for, and to increase your network. Here's the key thing. The purpose of this, do not ask for a job or internship. This is to do research and to find out more information although the connection may help you in the future. So tuck that away. This is an opportunity to learn about a career or role. And this is one of the most fruitful forms of networking I have ever recommended or done myself. Bottom line, stay in touch with your network. Don't reach out just when you need something. Reach out to them periodically to see how they're doing. Share what your wins are and congratulate them on their own. Keep your network fresh. Number three, backup plans. Remember I was talking about time frame and how we needed to adjust our expectations? Having several backup plans is very helpful. Your dream job, plan A, may not pan out initially. That doesn't mean you shouldn't stay in touch with the people, those employers, you know, keep those fresh because that, those industries will reopen at some point. And if you stayed in touch, you will be at the forefront of their mind. Plan B for you may be just to get a job to pay the bills. Make sure that you can pay the rent while you pursue other, other opportunities in the short term. Plan C could be to pivot to a completely different industry, which will take some work. But the bottom line is we're gonna need more than one plan in order to get through the time that it may take for you to find a position or someone that you care about. So these stories of Ian and Jasmine are not uncommon, but imagine 
if they use these tools, adjusted their perspective to create new features for themselves? What would happen to their sense of overwhelm, their sense of, of uncertainty? How does being prepared and connected to others help them? Let's imagine a new story for Ian. Let's suppose he networks with other people. He comes into the ICG, sit, has a sit down with Samantha Palmer, our coordinator for career planning, and they talk about transferable skills and decide that, wow, he's got great skills in relationship building and sales, and he's always been interested in fundraising. Samantha has connections in fundraising, so they set up an informational interview from him. From that has come several more informational interviews, and finally, a real one. He doesn't have a job in this field yet, but he's making progress. He's learned a lot. He and his wife have a new financial plan, and he has set up three plans for himself. Plan A is the possibility of returning to the hotel industry. It will open, and that's where all his contacts are. Plan B, he's taken a contract job in sales and is pursuing some sales opportunities on the side as well. Plan C is to pivot to fundraising, and this path is the one that's most fruitful for him right now. This is not perfect, but Ian and his wife have a plan for the future, and they sleep better at night. Let's imagine a new future for Jasmine. She was worried about her finances, so she made the difficult decision to move home for a period of time to stabilize her finances. She worked with our office in the ICG, networked with friends and family, and got a part-time job in customer service. This student is driven. She is convinced her plan A is she's gonna get that job she was offered originally. She is gonna stay in touch with that recruiter because that's where she's going to be. Great, I applaud that. Her plan B, she got the part-time job and she's networking her way into conversations in the financial services sector for opportunities there, there as well. Her plan C is to consider graduate school. So she's looking into things that would appeal to her there. She's stable financially. She has plans for the future. She's lowered her sense of overwhelm and she's very prepared to pivot to opportunities that come her way. I've shared some common works, you know, work experiences that people have had during the pandemic, presented some tools that we can use in any economy and those that will benefit us right now. I've used these tools to imagine some new futures for Ian and Jasmine. Preparation does not magically solve the problem of unemployment. I, I wish it did, but it does position us to be prepared when opportunities come our way. This does not happen by magic. It does not happen by luck. It happens by being prepared and being connected to other people. I wish you the very best and thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Robin. That was really wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and providing these preparatory strategies for, for our audience. Um, as you can see on the screen, we do have uh, the information available. Robin's contact information is here. Uh, I'm going to leave this up for a few minutes in case anyone wants to uh, copy this down or, or sure. take a screen cap. We will also be including her contact information and the ICG's contact information in our follow-up email as well if you want to get in touch or ask further questions. Um, I'd also like to encourage our audience, if you have questions you would like to ask Robin right now, we do have our chat open for this, so if you'd like to leave a question, uh, I'm going to begin q and I have a list of prepared questions here, but I'm also much more interested in hearing what you have to say and listening to the questions that you have. So uh, without further ado, Robin, uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch into that. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's keep going. Uh, as we've discussed, the environment that we're in right now, uh, unemployment in the U.S. has, uh, from my last numbers that I've seen, passed 13%. Uh, local and state authorities are making decisions about reopening as we speak. Uh, we started to see some restaurants reopen uh, as well as some other businesses. We find ourselves in a constantly evolving situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, more than ever, like you said, we're relying on the connections that we have or looking to make new connections. Uh, you already touched on this during your presentations, but where could you reiterate where people should be looking to network right now? I, I would start with people who are very close to you. Um, I think I, I, I mentioned this laundry list of people you can connect with, but do connect with the people who are closest to you first, your friends and family, any groups that you belong to. For those of you who are in school right now, you know, reach out to um, other fellow students, your faculty, anyone that you have a relationship is fair game. And those are people that we know want to help us. 
Fair enough. I mean, yeah, you're right. Relying on those networks is is going to make or break a lot of people's ability to to move forward with uh, finding a new job solution. Uh, Absolutely. You also mentioned uh, the ways in which we network and building off of that last question, uh, for me personally, especially in the scenario where you're going to a networking event, uh, you don't know other people, uh, it, it can be difficult or nerve wracking to kind of go into that and, and not really know what to do or feel awkward about starting a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I personally work a lot better if I've got a goal in mind mm -hmm. when I walk in the door so that my conversations are focused. So um, I guess the question is, what do you think makes for a quality professional networking interaction? For me, very much like you, Michael, I go to a formal networking event with very specific goals. I, uh, oftentimes I know that I want to meet someone from a specific organization or organizations, or I have a number of connections I would like to make. So I will do that. I also pr make sure that I know what I'm going to say, even though I've done this a lot of times I'm somewhat of an introvert, so I know I need the energy. So being prepared with an elevator pitch is very, very helpful. Just knowing how I will introduce myself to someone, what that connection point will be, it would be fantastic. So just being prepared and having goals like you mentioned, I think is ideal. It's that same, it's that same theme. Be prepared and, and go into a situation already having the material, or at least the foundations of it in place. Yes. Um, going off of those materials, how important would you say your LinkedIn presence really is? Um, what about having an up-to-date LinkedIn resume? How important is that uh, right now? I think it's huge. I really think it's huge. Um, LinkedIn, like I said, it's kind of, it's, there are other um, professional social media platforms out there, but LinkedIn is still the gold standard. And, you know, one of our students, I think is with us today, I see you here, Harusto, um, that's how he has his current position. Um, someone found him on LinkedIn because he had an excellent resume and his LinkedIn profile was polished. And uh, it, it's just, people can find you just like you can find others. So I think it's imperative. Agreed. And that's also, you know, how your, your network, they, you know, they see you too and they see what you're doing and it gives them a sense of your own, your own growth. Yeah, no, it's true. It's, it's so visible for our audience in general. Um, a related question uh, on the subject of kind of networking and, and another way of pivoting into, you know, a new plan. Uh, we have a question from the audience. What advice would you give someone that was looking or is looking to start a business or a new side gig during this uh, period? You know, uh, opportunities feel as though connections are being more difficult. Uh, what directions would you say someone looking to start something new should look? Um, what kind of resources do you think they should be looking to use? I imagine networking is still going to be key. It is, and I think with something like that, that's a, it's not, it's not your, they're not looking for mainstream connections, they're looking for very specific ones. Um, it depends on what they're looking for, but we do have, you know, lots of um, organizations that support startups and those kind of things. There are webs, you know, different websites that, um, like Upwork and whatnot, that advertise these things. But I really think there's nothing like connecting with individuals who've already done it. And one of the things that um, uh, Angela Crawford, who was our dean, of our dean of our business college did last year that I thought was amazing, um, she convened a group of sales and sales professionals and entrepreneurs, uh, two different events to do this very thing, to build um, this network within our, within our organization that we can share with our students and alumni. But also talk to people who already do this. Um, and don't be shy about reaching out to someone that you don't know because people are enormously generous and those who've been successful creating their own businesses really do want to reach out and share and share their experience. Um, and, you know, never forget, you know, reach out to your campus career office. We can connect you with some of these resources as can our chambers and many organizations in the Northern Kentucky area. Absolutely. Uh, and this actually ties into something else that you had mentioned passingly earlier, but in the context of starting a new business or, or a new opportunity, you mentioned having a, a polished elevator pitch. Yeah. Uh, we could do an entire hour on, <laughs> on elevator pitches uh, on, a, on its own, but could you give us kind of a high level overview? What is an elevator pitch and what does it mean to have a good elevator pitch? Well, you want people to remember you and they may or may not remember what you look like or what your name is but that's how you begin. I would introduce myself as Robin Norton, identify, identify myself with Thomas Moore in my role, and then perhaps share why I'm in a space. You know, I'm there to make connections. 
or my students and alumni. So they may walk out knowing, hey, I just talked to this lady. I want to reconnect with her, but I don't remember her name. They'll remember Thomas More, and they can find me that way. So I think having some way for people to reconnect with you. Right. If you're doing this live, you can you know, exchange business cards, and that's, that's your salvation. But in this day and age, um, when we're having events like this, you really have to track people down a little bit. Um, that elevator pitch, you know, while, you know, ad identifying with an organization is useful, if you can find something in common with the individual you're talking to, that's also very helpful. That grounds you in their memory. Definitely. So, th those kind of things. You want to be remembered. A common strategy that I've seen uh, that I also thought was very effective was uh, using, basically building a story out of your elevator pitch. Have a narrative that exactly. your listener can follow. Uh, and so it'll... Uh, it creates kind of an opportunity to, mm -hmm. for them to attach an idea either to your name or your position or where you're from. Yep, stories that, are that's, great, that's I love that. very effective for me yeah. as well. Um, I have one final question here. Again, audience, if you have other questions you'd like to leave in the chat, feel free to do so. Uh, but uh, the final question that I have is, um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of, uh, I know I personally have been glued to the news glued to updates and there have been uh, basically the overwhelming majority of things that I'm seeing are of either a saddening or negative nature. Um, do you see any success stories coming from the students or colleagues or people in your community during this time? Are there, are there positive stories of people that have found opportunities? There certainly are. There certainly are. I, I can think of one in particular and I, I think Samantha Palmer, you might be on here too. You might be able to add some detail. But we have a student um, that we've worked with quite frequently over the past year. She was one of our mock interview competition winners. She was very excited um, about an internship she had with the Reds this summer. But due to the pandemic and what happened to the sports industry, she wasn't able to have that. But this is one of those students that's really a go-getter. And she talked her way into an interview, completely different role. But she had, you know, she had references with the Reds. They spoke for her. And she didn't give up <laughs> and she has an excellent internship you know it's in a sales role it's related but it's not the same but she had the skills to do this she was ready and she was connected to other people and she was able to pivot to this opportunity that came her way it's oh i love those stories yeah that's fantastic it is fantastic yeah life is never just a straight path uh, nope. that you think but it sounds like she had the tools already prepared and she wasn't scared to move in directions that she right. hadn't expected. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, again, uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, as far as launching the series goes, I couldn't have asked for a better opening speaker. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and audience, thank you for joining us for the event. Again, just as a reminder, this is being recorded. So we are going to have this out and available on our Moreover website. Uh, the link to that will be available in the follow-up email that we will send after this. Uh, you can also keep submitting questions in the chat for the next couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, we may stop the recording, but we'll stay on the line for the next few minutes as well. Uh, again, it, we're so excited to do this. Uh, we are trying to provoke new stories. Uh, so Thomas More University here, we want to uh, present short, powerful talks devoted to spreading ideas, thoughts, and information to our community. Uh, Robin has been an amazing resource for us here and uh, will continue to be uh, for all the rest of our community here at Thomas More. And I'm sure she'd be happy to answer questions from people as well uh, that are listening. So thank you so much for joining us, Robin. Thank you, Michael.